Hi everyone, welcome back to the Stars and Startups podcast with me, Varun Dhani. I'm sure you're back for more illuminating stories of entrepreneurship and the journey of building businesses. Have you ever wondered what to do with an old phone that you have sitting around? Or have you wanted to buy a second phone as a backup but didn't know how to get a reliable one? That's where this startup comes in. On the episode, I catch up with Mandeep Panocha, co-founder of Catchify that has seen demand rebound with COVID as everyone scrambled to get a second device for their kid who now needs to attend classes digitally. We chat about the refurbished device market, running an unsexy business and having four Chinese investors on the cap table. Don't forget to take a moment and subscribe to the podcast or sign up for our newsletter. The links are available wherever you're listening to this episode. Okay, let's say hi to Mandeep. The attention span of people is uh, getting smaller and smaller. And I think you can see that in every domain. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, in relationships, your attention span is very small. Like you don't actually listen to, you know, when your partner is speaking or your mother or your father is speaking. Your attention span is just like a few seconds. Yeah. And, and then it's lost. What's next? Yeah. yeah. What's next? When you're on an, you're, you're on internet, you're maybe yeah. on Instagram and then, you know, you get bored in say 30 seconds or if something is engaging, you're there for 10 minutes. And then you suddenly, you know, want to know what's what's happening on Twitter. So you move. Okay. And I think uh, our, our association with the things that we own, uh, it's, it's kind of an overlap there as well. People, our attention span or the likelihood that we would want to change from one thing to the other mm-hmm. is changing very fast. Right. And I think that's, that's one thing that we've seen up close in terms of phone. You rightly said. Nokia 3310 would last at least four years. Like I know people who bought that phone in the first year of college. And uh, when we were exiting, they still had the same phone. All the numbers on the buttons were like gone. Oh, yeah. uh, by, you know, while you were playing Snake on it, but it would still work. And the battery would still last for two days or three days at max. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's from the product point. But uh, the people, you know, the products that are being made are also in such a fashion that after two years starts hanging, there are software issues, we want to change, yeah. but yeah. currently we want to change, we want to change, you know, things faster. And today I think people are changing their phones every 12 to 15 months mm. uh, in, in India. And yeah. if there, there are some, there are some parts in the world where they change phones every six months. Hey guys, uh, I have uh, Mandeep Manocha of Cashify with us uh, here today. Uh, hi Mandeep, welcome to the show. Hey, hi, hi. Nice to nice to be here, Varun. Thanks. No, uh, I'm super excited. Uh, until recently, I had a lot of phones lying around my home. And I always wondered, how can I get a good price for these phones? Okay. And um, I, when I lived in Gurgaon the last time, and, I mean, I, I've lived in Gurgaon. This is my second stint in Gurgaon, technically. And uh, the first time I lived here, was way back in uh, 2012, uh, 2013 is when I, you know, kind of exited. And when I went to a store to sell my uh, old phone, the guy would max give me about two grand just by looking at it and say, and he'll say, ha, sir, do hazar, right? And uh, you had no choice, right? I, I would be like, fine, you know, let's just get done with it because anyway, uh, the way that electronics, uh, have become there's so many getting released every few months that the uh, at least at that time very few android phones that had existed so maybe it would have dropped so much but there was no easy way to evaluate then i came across cashify and when i came across cashify and you know gave me a step by step understanding of okay how much it will cost for me to sell the phone and then it made it so easy for me. I was like, okay, let's just take out all the phones I have available. Uh, I had a tablet. I had one phone at that point. I'm like, okay, let's, you know, get rid of it. And I got cash like right away. And I was super impressed. Uh, to tell you the truth, in, in the, uh, when, I, when I was studying in the US, I had a couple of laptops lying around as well. And I could book. Uh, so they used to have these boxes. They used to send you these brown boxes where you place the laptop and you, you know, send it, and uh, you know you would have you could have evaluated the laptop before you order for the boxes because it'll tell you the price. 
yeah. and it reminded me so much of that whole experience except here a dude shows up at my door and then he you know checks something and he's like here uh, done and i got the cash in the next moment so super impress uh, you know i I'd, i'd love to dig more into that so uh, you know that that's when i said you know i want to have mandeep on the show and talk about uh, this this market uh, how has lockdown been for you man well first of all uh, thanks varun for being a power user i think before this you were talking you have sold five devices in the last two years so i think you are one of those uh, you know the key customers who keep coming back and i think uh, on an average a guy sells 1.2 to 1.3 phones a year on our platform so on an average you would you know an average guy would have sold 2 2.5 phones so you're like almost double of that so yeah thanks for being a great customer uh um, I, 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 have, I, have a, I have a submission though. Sorry, I have a submission. Yeah. One was my sure. sisters and one was my wife. So I'm like, you know what? <laughs> I'm gonna sell theirs too. <laughs> yeah. No. Tip, you know. You know. When I when, typically, typically the behavior that we've seen is that uh, the male in the family is the one who's actually selling the devices on the platform, and I would love to see that change, honestly, because you know I think 80, 85 percent of the customers on our platform are today male. uh it's it's come down from being 90 95% over the last two years and i hope that this number you know becomes better and we are able to target both the segments uh coming on uh, varun to your question on how covid has been i think uh, covid has been a great learning experience for everybody uh from business point of view i think uh, you know as everybody is taken a hit uh we too have taken a hit the worst month was april where uh, we had zero business but thankfully over the last two months the business has come back uh so we have two parts of the business and i think we'll get into that detail later but there is customer to business where a customer comes directly to cashify and cashify own properties and the other part of the business is where we work with uh, offline stores we work with e-commerce players we work with brands so the first one which is our c to b direct uh the business has come back to 90% of pre covid volumes oh, wow. uh, and i'm talking about july so july we did 90% of what we did in feb so that's very un- encouraging the other part of the business which is which has a lot of uh, dependence on offline stores opening up uh the new devices coming back to the market that business is still at 40 50% and we hope that in august once we have uh, the independence day sales and we have prime day on amazon things will start going up but apart from that i think uh, uh, you know business is now getting stabilized uh the company as 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 such we've taken a lot of drastic measures we've we've uh, you know as everybody is learned to do more with less so have we uh we've we've cut down our costs at every point where we could be it from the rentals in the office that we were uh to to salary rationalizations to renegotiating contracts with our uh, business associates we've done it all uh making all the right decisions to uh you know keep the company going so uh you know i'm i'm glad things are bouncing back uh but you know i want to dig a little deeper into cashify and and you know uh the refurb market um when i was reading about uh, you know what you guys do i heard of the term e-commerce and yeah I-, i was super impressed is that a term that you guys coined or was no. is this a term that <laughs> globally used <laughs> for uh, no, no. you know used products pre-owned yeah, this, this, people call it this yeah this term has you know been around e-commerce has been around i think uh, you know one of the first companies which did some significant work or which did some branding effort was uh, gazelle in the us uh, which made this slightly famous although e-commerce has been going on in different parts of the world i mean even in india i mean people sell their devices every now and then it's just that in the organized space a jazzy word was not there and i think this came by in the early 2000s Uh, and that's when gazelle hila different companies in the west uh, you know came into existence uh, we've we've just changed the way e-commerce has been is being done across the world okay 
you know, I think before this, we were talking about that box which, which used to come, where, where, you know, in the US, where you would put the device, the device would go to a central facility somewhere, they would evaluate it, and then you will get your money. I think Cashify, uh, I can say with 99.99 degrees of confidence that we were the first company who started giving cash or started giving you money at the time we were picking up the device. Nobody in the world was doing it. Mm. So we've kind of changed the way things, you know, were done. And that was also due to the reason, you know, our country has a very different dynamics. Right. It's a very low trust market. You know, if I would not trust giving my product to somebody without getting money. I mean, I'm talking about six years ago. And we've all grown up seeing our newspapers being sold. We've all grown up seeing all the boxes and bottles being sold in a household by our mothers. And you would see instant cash coming out and your mothers would be negotiating at that point as well. Yeah. So the, the, the concept of giving something and waiting for your money is completely alien to our society. And I, I think that's it was the need that we fulfilled. Uh, it's not, you know, it's nothing that we invented. Uh, we just, it was a compulsion that we had to do this and we just figured out the right way of doing it. When I was in e-commerce and, you know, uh, my first in Gurgaon was at jabong.com and I remember one of the hardest things for us was to do uh, a reverse pickup. Yeah. And privately, the challenge of reverse pickup, uh, and I believe that complexity exists today as well, is that you really can't plan your day. And it, you know, instead of going from a central hub to multiple locations, uh, you know, it, it, it's just so much easier, right? Because you have a route, you have deposits, uh, and, and you know what route can be planned. But in the case sure. of reverse pickup, you don't know where it is uh, going to come from, where your demand is going to be, etc. So you had to outsource your logistics to a large extent, right? Uh, and e-commerce businesses don't, didn't do logistics, so they always left it to a third party to do it. But in this yeah. scenario, uh, I see a lot of parallels where you're working with, you know, you need folks to go and collect a device when it comes in as, you mm -hmm. know, uh, somebody wants to sell it. It's an ops heavy business. Uh, yeah. and, and also it is a little bit of smarts because a guy has to actually do something at the client's place. I would imagine that's how the purchase happens, right? When you're bringing the device in. Yeah. Why did you take on such a hard problem? <laughs> you know, I, I'll take a step back on, uh, you know, why we are doing this. You know, where, what is the genesis of Cashify? So if you look at our uh, registered name of the company, it's called Manak Waste Management. So when we started back in 2009, you know, the aim was to build one of the largest waste management companies in the country. And uh, we dabbled our hands with different kind of waste streams. We worked on solid waste management. We did some work with Indian Railways to figure out if you could, you know, reduce the waste along the railway lines across the country. Uh, we tried our hands at, you know, solving the water waste problem. But one thing that really, you know, we were successful and we thought there is very little competition back in 2009 was electronic waste management. And uh, we, we, once we researched, we figured out that recycling of a product is not difficult. Okay. Uh, your mobile phone, which is lying in your drawer or in your closet is not a waste. It's not waste. It's not harming the, harming the environment till the time it is lying there. Okay. Yeah. It's only waste when it comes back or you throw it in the dustbin and it goes to a landfill. That is where it actually becomes waste. So we've, we've figured out that recycling is easy. Mm. The biggest challenge is can you collect these devices from people's homes? Mm. And that is where we started our journey with a couple of brands to power their recycling programs, the reverse pickup, reverse logistics program. We did that for a couple of years. Uh, and after reaching a particular scale, we realized that it's very difficult for a two member team to build a large company around it. Uh, so we shifted gears and we started a recycling facility of converting scrap rubber and plastic into oil. So that is a very he operations heavy problem. We actually set up a large factory 
we were uh, recycling 10 metric tons of uh, waste tires automobile tires every day wow. and converting that into oil and that oil was being used in uh, in factories that would melt uh, aluminium scrap iron scrap copper scrap and convert them into ingots so we've already we've always been a very operational guys you know we we love doing things which are highly brick and mortar uh, we've set up a factory we've run it for three years we sold that factory and that's when in 2013 we you know wanted to check what's going on in e-waste you know because that's something that we we learned initially you know, we loved initially and that's where you know when when we saw that people are changing their gadgets faster mm -hmm. and still you know 60 or 70 percent of india does not have access to these gadgets so there's right there's a large supply pool which is coming out where people are changing their gadgets faster and there is an inherent demand where 70% of the country does not have access to these gadgets. And the only way to give them access is to make them cheap because these guys are at the bottom of the pyramid. They can't afford. So we saw a market. So we saw that if we could sustain, you know, build a su supply source which we can sustain, we can, you know, in the end, uh, get these devices routed to people who actually need it. So, you know, the question is, why did we start this Operation Heavy business because yeah. we come from that background we have that dna and we saw a problem which we could solve mm -hmm. and i think if you if you look at our bus business there are a lot of elements of tech right. but operations is is backbone of our business and that's why covid was tough on us because operations was completely shut down for almost right. 45 days you know i i'm super uh, i'm impressed with kind of the evolution right uh, that E-waste and waste in general uh, were, is not a very sexy business to be in. And in 2009, um, you know, from what I can see, you this is just after graduating, you started this yeah. company. Um, yeah. Was that the intent to graduate and then, you know, uh, this is your calling at that point? Well, I think, uh, you know, Nakul and I, we go back almost, what, 17 years now. And our third wow. co-founder, Amit, Amit joined us in 2014 when we started Cashify. But Nakul and I, we go back to our undergrad school and we were in the same hostel. So, you know, back in 2004, five, we would make plans of uh, starting a company together. And, you know, if somebody heard us at that point, he would laugh because we used to make plans of 100 crores, 200 crores back then. Just, just you know, to get some kicks because, you know, ultimately you don't have a lot of work. When you are in an engineering school, you have a lot of time on your hands. So we used to make these plans. 2007, you know, I entered my B school in Bombay. Uh, mm -hmm. Nakul went to MTI. And it was interesting that Lehman Brothers happened in 2008. And I was one of the interns working at Lehman, uh, mm -hmm. hoping to get a, get a PPO. But all of those dreams and plans went down the drain. And I think mm -hmm. at that point, when I did not have a job in 2009, I decided to come back to my hometown in February of 2009, just leaving the placement season in between uh, with the thought that, okay, if, if, you know, there is no job coming by and the jobs are not that the ones that I really want, why do I have to work uh, for somebody else? Why can't I work for my, you know, for myself, at least yeah. give it a try and start something on my own. And uh, Nakul was in uh, Paris. He was also kicked out because it was, you know, there were no jobs there. So we decided to join hands, give it a try. And uh, thankfully, the stars aligned. And we got a lot of uh, lot of good mentors in the initial days. We got a lot of support from a few institutions where, uh, I mean, indirectly, we got a lot of support from MDI because they were running an incubation cell. And one of our friends had gotten an office in MDI as part of the incubation. We did not. And the day we found out, we like, okay, dude, you have this whole big room. That's your table. I'm getting my table and my two chairs. We want to share this <laughs> space because we don't have any anywhere else to, else to go. Right. So we just forced our way into an incubation center, sat there for initial one and a half years, no electricity bill, no rentals, nothing. And we started slowly building our journey from there. You kept your overheads extremely low. And yeah, it, was, it was almost zero. It was it was zero. <laughs> my only my only cost uh, in those days 
were the petrol bill because I used to travel from Faridabad to Gurgaon and the food we used to eat. And that was all the luxury that we could afford at that point. <laughs> but why waste management? What was that, uh, uh, you know, what got you to, uh, you know, specific uh, problem statement? Well, I think uh, I saw recycling while growing up because my father used to work in a company which would recycle aluminium scrap. Uh, and I spent my summers in the junkyards just, you know, learning the ropes of different metals. So uh, without boasting, I can say that if you were to give me five metals in my hand, I can tell you which is which. So I can tell you if this is aluminium, this is iron, this is copper. And that's the training I got while growing up. So recycling was somewhere back there in my head. And when we graduated, I actually want, you know, uh, organically my mind tilted towards waste and see what, what are the opportunities there. And given that it was very early days for electronic waste, uh, yeah. not a lot of people actually find it a sexy business, as you rightly said, yeah. and which in turn, which in turn means that there'll be a lot less competition because in India, you start something and you're successful. There are 10 people, you know, ready to copy it. Okay. Yeah. So that was, that was the other thing. There were not a lot of people who wanted to do this. And I always saw opportunity in a pile of waste. I, I do that today as well. If I go anywhere and I see a big junkyard or a waste pile, I get excited because I can see that, you know, there is, there is stuff that you can make money out of. And uh, there is, there is no specific reason. It was just, there was, there was an inclination and it's something that I, that I enjoyed and uh, made a living out of it now. It's a very interesting way to kind of get in. Uh, you already had a, uh, mentioned the predisposition to want to do this. Uh, so I, I, I think you've uh, spent the last many years trying to uh, make it work and now using a tech layer to solve for it. Um, so when you look at refurb, uh, refurbished products, um, I don't think a lot of people understand, you know, uh, you know, e-commerce and refurb where you're saying that, okay, I bought an item from someone and I'm selling it to somebody else. Is there some value addition that happens in between? Is that what refurb is? Yes. Yes. So refurbish essentially would mean that if you have a product which has some flaw and you've, you've actually made that flaw right, either by changing parts or repairing it, plus you clean the data, you make sure that the data sanity is there, uh, you make sure that the device looks and feels the look and feel of the device is you know as good as something that you would want to buy from market. Uh, uh, in some cases, you pack it in a new packaging, give a new earphone charger, etc. In case of a mobile phone, or if it's a laptop, you just you know uh, give us you know jazzy bag around, along with it. Uh, so that's what refurbish. I mean, you need. Uh, there, there is some kind of value addition which has gone into the phone. Otherwise, there is a lot of transaction that goes between people. Like if I sell my phone, which is in completely working condition to you today, uh, technically I can't call it that I'm selling you a refurbished phone. Right. It's, it's, it's a transaction between two people or yeah. as a company also, if I sell something to you, which you know I've not done any value addition, then yeah. technically I can't call it a refurbished phone. Yeah. But this term has been very loosely used. Mandi, when we were discussing earlier, uh, you mentioned that there's a lot more interest in buying secondhand phones right from the time of 2013, uh, 2012, when uh, you know e-waste and and buying these phones started becoming uh, you know popular. Uh, what are some of the trends that we're seeing? Are uh, because I know that India has a a high interest in secondhand cars, right? That's always yeah. been the case since. Time immemorial that you'll buy your first car probably is a second-hand vehicle. You you know you have aspirations, but you don't want to pay that much, so you start somewhere and start figuring out okay how does this work, what is it for, and, and then slowly kind of move up the value chain to buy new products and you know new bills etc. Is that exactly what's happening in the phone market? Uh, it's very similar, Varun. Uh, there are there are two kind of customers who today buy a refurbished phone. One is a guy who's moving from a feature phone to a smartphone. And his reasons are that he uh, wants access to internet. He yeah. sees his peers uh, getting onto 
you know, mobile payments. And to a very large extent, entertainment is the major drawing factor for, for people who are moving on to a smartphone mm-hmm. today. Because if you go to any, you know, society, the guards are playing PUBG, the guards are, you know, consuming a lot of content. People see that and they want to, you know, move on to the internet bandwagon. So that's one kind of customer. The second kind of customer is the one who can't afford an iPhone or a Samsung phone, but aspires to own that. And as as a society, we've always been aspirational, uh, not just in India, but across the world. We, humans are aspirational. You want to move from one one uh, stepping stone to the other. And I think that's what you mentioned in the, in the case of cars. Uh, people move from a scooter to a Maruti 800 and slowly, gradually go up. We've seen that behavior where somebody who used to own a Micromax or a Lava or a, or a Zolo, you know, back in the days, I'm talking 2014, 15, when these brands were, were, were there in the market today, they're not. Mm. People were moving from them to, say, uh, a Motorola or a Lenovo and then to a Samsung and then ultimately people who want to buy an Apple. And Apple is still the holy grail even today. Uh, from a data perspective, perspective uh, iPhones contribute to only 2%. Mm-hmm. of uh, the smartphone market in India by volume. Right. But on our platform, iPhones contribute 18% of the devices that we buy and sell. Wow. So there's a lot of demand for, for that you know, uh, brand and product and people are very happy to pay a slight premium on whatever Android they could buy. But still, it's, it's at a very discounted price. You can get an iPhone 6 today at say 12,000, 13,000 rupees. Uh, and one interesting, you know, fact I always find very fascinating is people who buy refurbished phones from us, mm-hmm. they never tell anybody that they've bought a refurbished phone. Wow. I mean, most of most of the people don't tell. And we did a small survey to, you know, find this thing out with a few intelligent questions. And we figured out that people want to use these devices as as a kind of status symbol in their in their society. So they don't want right. to tell people that that these are secondhand. They would pass it on as a new product. Well, so well, I find I mean, that very fascinating. It, it's interesting you say that, right? Because ultimately you actually own a phone that probably sold for 35, 40,000 rupees at its head. Right. right? Yeah. So its actual value is, you know, pegged at that amount. But yeah. today, by owning it, and, and a lot of people own phones for a long period of time. It's no different. They yeah. actually own an iPhone 6 and, you know, uh, though they paid 13,000, the value is actually what uh, it initially sold at, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's the perception of the brand. And I think people want to associate themselves with the brands. Mm. So that's, that's, that's the driving power or the driving force behind refurbished products becoming mainstream. And a lot of people ask me that, hey, Mandeep, the, the prices of the devices are coming down. Mm. Do you think there would be a demand for secondhand phone two years down the line or three years down the line? And my answer to that is that, look, Phones are not becoming cheap. It's a right. it's a misconception. Today, if you look at an iPhone 11 Pro, it's more than a lakh. Mm-hmm. And if you pick up any brand today, and I can I can give you examples right from Vivo, Oppo, Xiaomi, Samsung. Mm-hmm. In the last three years, all of them have become expensive by 25 to 30 percent. If you look at the top of the line, they've all become expensive by 25 to 30 percent. So devices are not getting cheap. It's just a misconception. That people think go devices are getting cheap. Why? Why is that happening though? Why? Why are these brands moving more upstream? Are they saying that since Apple is pe- pegging the price, I am able to push the amount of money that I could make as well, and kind of just uh, you know, kind of go up the value chain? I think yeah, to a large extent, that's it. That's that's the reason because most of these companies they were not making any money in the sub sub fifteen k segment. Uh, so everybody wants to have that you know, premium product on which they can make, make money. It's like, it's like any luxury brand. I mean, uh, you know, you sell less, but you make more margin. And that's, that's why most of these brands are now coming up with these expensive phones. I mean, just, just last week, Vivo launched a phone at a, at a very high price point, which is completely, you know, against their ethos, but everybody's doing it. I mean, I was speaking to one of the, uh, you know, CEOs of this very large Chinese mobile phone manufacturer. And, and he told me that Madeep, Below 10K segment, nobody makes money. Nobody makes money. It's just we want people to get hooked to the product, 
get hooked to the brand and then we would hope that this guy would say tomorrow buy something which is in the 15 to 20k bracket is it hard um, in that case do people ask for premium phones on your platform because that seems to be where the most value you get uh, you know like you said uh, if it's aspirational they're like you know what i want that phone uh, because then my I, i don't know if this is ever tied with self worth but you know, yeah. i just feel <laughs> it's a lot more valuable right like yeah no you're right people people the demand for premium phones is pretty high uh, but having said that you know the the lower segment phones are also what we sell to a large extent Uh, because that's the other segment people are moving from feature phone to smartphone so we've clearly demarketed our audiences as well you know a large segment you know is the first time user in tier 2 tier 3 towns uh does not know or does not want to buy a new product at the at the price point of 10k 12k but happy is happy to buy something for 5k 6k so that's that's segment and of course the premium segments of apple samsung uh premium xiaomi phones there's a huge demand in that segment as well Do, do people actually mail in and say hey i want this specific phone because i would imagine like stocking phones would be a huge challenge um, you know if you go to a surplus store and i'm from chennai and you know <laughs> where, where where do you have a uh, uh, you know when i was in college we used to love going to these stores which you know sold sold uh, surplus uh, you know uh, i i guess they call yeah. them manufacturing surplus or something and you would want yeah. the nike or you would want the no fear t-shirt or or whatever they were selling ferrari and you would only get you know medium size right <laughs> you'll only get yeah, like yeah. small I... or excel because the, the the moment they come they're probably the first to go right um, yeah. i would imagine in a platform like yours you're not going to get the pick of the products right away and if you do uh, there's going to be a smaller amount of stock and and is that one of your biggest challenges how do you manage for that well honestly varun uh, our model has been uh, predominantly uh, offline to a large extent and it's only recently that we are now pushing on the e-commerce uh, platform of our own uh, essentially there are two reasons the first one is that uh, this category is still new mm-hmm. people want to have the touch and feel of the product while they're buying right okay so that's why we felt that you know you need to have an offline presence maybe open your own stores uh, which today we have we have around 35 stores of our own uh, plus work with existing retail channel and feed these retail outlets so that they can sell so we never faced the problem of uh, you know inventory or 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 specific models being available because people don't buy directly from us so we have a very strong merchant network who buys from us and then they redistribute on the platform that we operate now so we have a, we recently you know started pushing some uh, focus on store.cashify.in and we do see we do see you know customer uh, inquiries customer queries on chat that hey i want an iphone 11 or i i want a samsung note 10 or note 10 pro uh and that's that's a good input for us to you know get a sense of the market of what people want so that we can focus uh, on procuring the same from people see at the end of the day if i know that varun wants an iphone 11 and there are a lot of people who want an iphone 11 i can jack up my sourcing prices on the platform and say okay if you have an iphone 11 i'll pay 80000 rupees or 85000 rupees uh so that's how we are managing uh, i think going forward in the next 6 months there are focus on our own online e-commerce platform is going to increase we would start seeing this problem of inventory getting uh, uh you know sold off quickly uh but i think today you know we are in a in a situation where we have offline we have our own stores we have a distribution and we have uh, our e-commerce so we can you know uh, distribute our inventory accordingly what i'm hearing from you is that a lot of the sales happen offline and and not yeah. typically online so the this like rather i can sell my product using the application which is online and then these phones typically go through this process of refurbishment and then go to these offline locations Perfect. which then get put into the hands of customers right? yeah yeah um yeah, yeah. so so then 
do these uh, store owners then choose the phones that they want to sell and then they have some other mechanism to buy the phones from you yeah so all these merchants they are on a you know a b2b application so mm. every day the moment a phone comes to our back end facility and it is tested graded or refurbished it gets automatically pushed to that merchant network which is visible to everybody across the country so if If you're in Chennai and you are my partner, you would see the inventory which I have in Gurugram. And if you like that device, you can just place an order and we ship it to them. Wow. So ultimately, it's it's a very open-ended platform for all these merchant partners. So they can buy whatever they want. Uh, typically, we ship the device the same day or the next day. So it's it's like an e-commerce behavior or an e-commerce okay. platform, but it's a close-knit uh, platform for merchants. Okay, so your buyers are. the business sales which is the uh, merchant uh, yes. you know it, it reminds me of uh, you know i i sold my car as well uh, not so long ago and uh, being the you know i i love using new tech and new platforms and i sold my car through uh, car story port and uh, it was pretty fascinating they take all your photos uh, they they put on their platform and dealers bid for your car yeah right? um so basically that means that me as a customer get the best price for my vehicle in that condition on that date right yeah um yeah. are you able to maximize with the bidding system with these merchants at that point because they probably know demand on the ground right because they have years on yeah. the ground they know who they can sell it to they probably know more in terms of uh, the money that you're leaving on the table Uh, not working on the consumer side yeah well i think uh, that's that's interesting we've over the last 5 years we've thought of bidding platform multiple times uh, but we haven't made it yet one of the key reasons that we felt that bidding may not work in our case that the price point is not very high you know on on an average a phone's value is say anywhere between 5000 to 15000 in the range of that now when you're selling a car the ticket size is 3 lakh rupees or 4 lakh rupees okay so for somebody to actively participate in a bidding process and wait or invest that much time to win that particular product yeah you know he can he can uh, bid for say four products in a day win one product and he's done he's he's happy he's going to make his 10% on that 4 lakh rupee car when you come on the phone uh in order to buy 100 phones a day probably you will have to bid on 500 phones right. and if there are multiple biddings you know mm-hmm. at at some point it will become very difficult for a single guy or a merchant to do that so we've stayed away from bidding we we are we are figuring out another way where we can get them to bid on a bundle of 25 phones or 50 phones in one go uh but the way cars is being done we may never do that because essentially the market may not allow for that kind of behavior i, I mean you know if you remember uh, ebay and and bazi and all these guys uh, those are very low ticket items as well right yeah uh, i mean you could start your bidding at 1 rupee and yeah, at, yeah. at one time i think i sold uh, an audio cassette for 1 rupee not knowing what <laughs> i was doing Yeah, um, that was. And then <laughs> I told the I told the buyer, sorry, man, I have no idea what I was doing. Sorry about this. I don't want to sell my uh, I don't know what it's called now ten hits or something, like that, right? I'm not selling you now ten for one two p, and I'm not going to yeah. ship it to you <laughs> for a buck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those those were interesting times. I remember eBay. There was this this ticker which was always going on on the pricing yeah. and, and the timing was just a lot of pressure on you, like. Okay, I need to buy this right now. But I think you know um, we all know it didn't work out. I mean, I don't see eBay active uh, almost anywhere. The, the the way of doing transaction is is not that prevalent anymore. And there could be a reason. There is precisely a reason because people don't want to get into those pressure situations. You know, I'll tell you an example. If whenever I go to you know a, a shopping mall in a store. uh and i'm looking at a shirt and somebody comes on my back like the guy comes and said sir may i help you i like get the fuck away i don't want you 
I don't want yeah, pressure yeah, on yeah. my head when I when I'm buying something. Okay, and I think if you put some somebody in that situation, even on an online platform, you're like, I am not going to do this. So maybe that's one of the emotions, but it's very personal. It's very subjective. Uh, I don't I don't know what's you know what is the right way or not. But I think that does not work for me, and I think that does not work for a lot of people that I know. So. Right. Uh, no, I, 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 yeah, I, I think the, you know the price point does uh, matter, and and bidding in in general, I think is a very uh, there's a huge cognitive load for you yeah. uh, to make a purchase decision, and I think uh, I, right now I think the times have changed. You don't have that much uh, time to also yeah. sit and sit in front of a ticker and and buy something, especially when you know uh, I'm sure I don't know what the uh, metrics were. But next to the bidding option, you have the buy now option. I'm sure a lot of people decided to buy now. Yeah, the bidding. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it's very feature. stressful, man. Bidding is damn stressful. I, I'll tell you an example. You know, recently, uh, my father told me that you could buy properties of bank auctions. Okay, right. and you know, so I, I, you know, a lot of people that I know, you know, they were looking at uh, buying properties at this age. That's one of the conversations that a lot of you know people of my age have, and I really don't want to participate. But I said, like, let me let me give it a shot because the price point was really attractive. Like the base right. price was maybe thirty percent of what the market value was. I mm-hmm. said, okay, I'll participate, dude. I was so stressed out when the bidding was going on, <laughs> when that ticker goes on and on, and somebody keeps pushing in, say, you know, fifty thousand more, fifty thousand more. In 20 minutes, I will like shut my laptop. Like I don't want to do. I don't want to be part of it because that's too much stress. Too much yeah. stress. So I think uh, even at that price point, you know, when you are uh, buying something which is in millions, uh, the pressure is too high. So if you are buying something which is five thousand rupee, do you want to be in that pressure situation where you want to do that like 10 hours a day and buy 50 devices? Maybe not. Where do a lot of these um, merchants? Who are your resellers? Uh, where are they located? How do they come to know of Cashify, uh, and and does it give them enough value for them to be part of the network, uh, or is it like yeah. a typical franchising model? How does it work? Okay, so these guys are not franchisees, and I'll tell you typically before we came into existence, uh, what was the behavior of these merchants? So resellers have always been there. People in the yeah. business of buying second hand products and selling to end customers have been there before our existence. Yeah. Typically what they would do is and most of our buyers are in satellite towns or tier 2 tier 3 cities. Uh just to give you an example in Gurgaon if you're in Gurgaon a lot of our uh, buyers are from Rewadi, uh, Rewadi, uh, Sonipat, Panipat, you know, satellite towns and you know in some cases even even deeper. and uh, before us all these guys they would come to delhi there's a market called gafar market which is the hub of uh, second hand products in the country and i think all the major cities metro cities have a have a market in bangalore there is something called a national market uh, in chennai i'm forgetting there's this interesting lane i'm forgetting the name in bombay there's a place called hira panna and uh, lamington road so the the behavior was that these people would once in 15 days travel from their satellite towns come to these markets and procure and then go back sell uh, and then repeat the cycle what we've done is you know we've given them this platform and said that wherever you are i will solve for your supply because we know that you have a counter you are good in selling you should not worry in your sourcing you don't spend two days of your precious time which you could have uh, used to sell your product you stay where you are we will get the product to you so that's that's the problem that we solve for them majority of our buyers are from these satellite tier 2 tier 3 towns and as we are going further we are you know getting buyers from as uh, remote as leh in ladakh uh, and you know uh, uh, in northeast we have buyers you uh, today we have buyers from across the country and uh, we solve their sourcing problem so that they can you know buy from us and make money at their counters Uh, we don't have feet on street anymore we used to have feet on street earlier when we started we had like a team who would go to markets and talk about us uh, but now you know the word of mouth is spreading people are finding us organically so you're saying that a lot of phones that get sold don't actually make it to your website uh, and they directly go into this platform 
which then gets yeah. uh, purchased uh, and then goes out. True. Um, yeah. So, uh, how much would somebody make on a phone? Like two, two, three thousand rupees, uh, and then you know maybe if they sell about twenty phones a month, they could make forty to fifty thousand straight up. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'll I'll give you a dynamic between uh, dynamics of the unit economics between the point where I we buy a phone from a customer till the point it goes to an end customer's hands. There is a thirty-five odd percent arbitrage. So if I buy a phone from you yeah. at say ten thousand rupees, an end customer who would buy this phone would buy it for say thirteen thousand five hundred or fourteen thousand rupees. So there is this thirty-five yeah. or forty percent margin. Now there are multiple layers. The first layer is us. Then there is a retailer who then sells it to yeah. a customer. In certain cases, there are three layers wherein we buy it, we give it to an aggregator or a distributor. Then there is a retailer, and then there is a customer. And there's one case that you know we buy a phone from Varun, and then there is a Mandeep who wants to buy this phone through our mm. website, and we sell directly. So depending on where you are in the value chain, you can make anywhere from say ten percent to twenty five percent. Understood. Uh, because I, I would imagine like uh, ref- doing a refurb, fixing up stuff, etc., also does cost uh, some amount of money. And yeah. Uh, so do these parts come from phones that are completely like damaged or you know, do you do you actually use new parts uh, to fix it up no we we uh, cannibalize the parts that we buy uh, the phones that come in and they're dead we do cannibalize the parts mm. but a lot of majority of the parts that we buy are either from the local market uh, from the brand service center or we import them from china I mean, you have a large enough operation, so you can choose to yeah. import if you'd like to. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, no. So we have we have a team uh, which was sitting in Shenzhen before COVID happened. Now, now these yeah. guys are back here, and their job was to just daily go out in the market and uh, source parts for us and ship on a daily basis. Oh wow! Uh, what what's the scale of the operation now? Can you give some idea? So we do around hundred and. Uh, I mean, before COVID, we were doing around hundred and thirty thousand phones a month. Wow! And is that your north star, like just more number? Yeah, that's that's. Or, yeah. Um, and do you, uh, with COVID, uh, is that going to get impacted in terms of? Uh, because I would imagine with COVID, uh, you know, the whole situation now, where a lot of people, uh, including in tier two towns, etc. Uh, there's a lot of movement to uh, more education or uh, digitally uh, yeah. communicating digitally, etc. Uh, that would, you would have seen a, a spike in terms of requirement. Uh, you know, then now if a, if a home had one phone or one device, they probably need more because you know if they have young children, they need to study or do something else, and that probably becomes a, a, a necessity. Is that what you're seeing on the ground? Yeah, very much, Varun. We've we've seen that a, a completely new pocket of demand has opened up. Mm-hmm. Uh, parents are buying phones for their kids. Who can afford? They are definitely buying a phone for their kid. And unfortunately, there are a lot of kids who don't get access to a phone right now, and they're moving out of that education, uh, you know, system. And we are trying to address that separately. And I'll I'll touch upon that as well. But yeah, a lot of people are buying. I mean, uh, my maid has bought five phones in the last one week uh, because she bought a phone for her kids, and then uh, the locality where she lives, you know, a lot of uh, her friends they asked for a phone because it was, you know, she got a phone at four thousand rupees, and it was a big six six and a half inch screen. You could study in that phone. So I've seen that upfront personally. And I've seen that a lot through our merchant partners that there's a lot of demand for phones for education. We've also seen, uh, Varun, interestingly, a lot of NGOs are now getting active in terms of sourcing phones which are to be distributed yeah. to you know underprivileged kids. Yeah. And as part of Cashify, we've uh, we've also started a campaign. Uh, asking people to donate their old phones, which would be refurbished and given to these kids for education purpose. 
uh, initially we you know we did some phones on our own we we, we gave up some 100 phones to a couple of ngos and then we realized that if you want to scale it up you can't just keep giving phones from your own balance sheet uh, so we've now you know uh, launched a program called cashify donate for education it's there on our website uh, anybody I can leave you know, come in yeah yeah that that'll be really helpful anybody can come you know you don't want to sell your phone you have something lying in your drawer just give it give it to us we'll come to your home pick up the phone refurbish it and then give it to our ngo partners to be redistributed in in underprivileged kids and i've seen i'm seeing results actually at at the ground grassroots level that the kids who are sending us videos their kids who are sending us videos studying uh, and actually this you know we realized that as as part of the community you can uh, with this make a small contribution uh, so yes i mean not going much deeper into this i mean there are new pockets of uh, demand uh, opening up in education uh, specifically and uh, my wife works in an education company a tech company and uh, i sit with her when she makes a few calls to kids and many a times when she calls uh, the kids you know the question we ask is okay look you were studying in in the morning today but you haven't logged in uh, in the yeah. evening and the answer is that you know that was my father's phone my father's at work now he's going to come back at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock at night and only then i'll log in Oh, so um, there is a real need that has really opened there is up, a real need. and I think um, how how are parents solving it? One is of course buying, but I I would imagine uh, that you know the need uh, means that you know like either they give them a tablet because it's very easy for somebody to uh, also uh, because if you're connected all the time, you know you're also going to find other distractions, uh, etc. Are you are you hearing that as well? Like, you know, if, if are you guys trying to solve something there? Well, honestly, yeah, we haven't solved anything there because ultimately we feel that uh, once the device is out in the hands of kids, we have a very limited control. Uh, but I have heard, like my one of my maids was telling me that, uh, uh, you know, in one day all her data was gone because the kids downloaded a movie of yeah. Two and a half, three GB, and all the data was finished. And she was like, you know, I need to spend another three hundred, four hundred bucks to get the data. Now these are real problems uh, yeah. because the education level is not there at the grassroots level. So even even they don't know, and the kids yeah. even accidentally click on something, and a lot of data is consumed. So yeah, that's a problem, uh, but we haven't solved for it. Uh, I don't think we'll have we have the bandwidth and the time to build software layer on that right now. Yeah, uh, yeah, but maybe late, you know, later in the in future, we may we may think of something like that. Are there plans to go global with uh, Cashify model uh, that you guys have perfected with uh, over uh, you know one hundred thirty thousand a month phones that they're selling? Yeah, we we've, we've actually uh, we've we've set up a enterprise SaaS team to take our tech product globally. We are not setting up our own operations ourselves. because as you know it's a very highly operation intensive business and always helps to have a local partner or somebody who's already in the business of e-commerce or say an e-commerce company who wants to start a trade in program or an exchange program so we are we are taking the route of becoming an enabler by giving our tech platform and the know how uh, we've initiated something in in bangladesh uh, we we are powering a e-commerce platform through our backend technology in bangladesh uh, it's live we we are now also powering some diagnostic capabilities for insurance companies in southeast asia uh, and of course there's one more company in bangladesh we're doing uh, we're working with and there are there are a lot of uh, transactions which are in pipeline in israel uh, there's something going out in gcc uh, the gulf area Uh, so yes we're going out but we're taking a different route we're not setting up operations on our own and gcc is a very interesting uh, you know geography in you know uh, i i i told you there are there are pockets in the world where people change their phones every 6 months uh, gcc is one of that locations uh, people in saudi they change their phones every 6 8 months max because there you know there are not many avenues to spend money so mobile phone is one of the uh, you know aspects that you know one of the one of the products that they want to change uh, pretty fast so that's a very interesting market for us 
But if people are changing phones every six months, uh, are they buying new ones or they're just like just trying no, second-hand phones? They're buying new ones, uh, dude. There's so much money. Okay. There's so much oil <laughs> money there. Why would they buy a second-hand phone in Saudi? So what happens to the used phones? <laughs> yeah, so a lot of the used, a lot of used phones are now uh, making their way to Africa uh, from that region. Plus, uh, there is a lot of migrate, migratory population which works on the oil rigs and in the construction mm. industry in that geography. So they buy those second-hand devices as well. Okay. Uh, actually, we didn't touch upon this and you, you just brought it up. Uh, the diagnostic that you're selling to insurers, right? Yeah. Um, is, is this the diagnostic tool that you're... Uh, I mean, I took a little bit of pri- uh, privilege uh, because I've seen the process work uh, maybe a lot of yeah. our listeners haven't. Uh, so there's an app that he installed on my phone, which he then used to identify the, the I guess, the situation of the phone, right? Correct. Um, that uh, I believe this is the tool that you use to have uh, improved the process at the end, uh, you know, at the pickup point, which makes it extremely objective in terms of evaluating a device. Um, is that where the IP is? Is that where the technology uh, and, and, and kind of the mind space, mind power is gone? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, diagnostic that we are selling is the same. Uh, but the one that we are selling to insurance partners and other companies is slightly more elaborate. One which you may have used is a customer version of it. So it would have like very limited test and the UI and the UX would be different. But the second thing that we are, uh, you know, now perfected is image recognition. So today, you know, one of the major pain points is that you can functionally check the phone remotely, but you don't know whether the phone screen is broken or not, if there is a crack in the screen or not, or the body of the phone is dented or not. So what we've done is we've, uh, since we do hundreds of thousands of phones every month, over the last one year, we've fed a lot of image data to a central processing uh, algorithm and now we are at a we are at a place i won't say we are like 100 percent there but we are you know 95 to 97 percent accuracy level where you feed us four images of your phone from different angles and we'll tell you remotely whether your phone's physical condition is okay or not whether there's a crack whether there's a dent whether there's a scratch or not so the idea is that you know make this process so objective that when the customer Customer, when, when our pickup boy goes to the customer's house, there is no objectivity. The other use case is that when somebody is buying insurance for, say, a damage of their phone, uh, for screen damage protection or something, uh, the insurer does not know whether your phone screen is already broken or not. So that's why today, today if you go to buy a damage protection, you won't be able to buy a damage protection if your phone's age is more than seven days. What we're doing is trying to, you know, make it possible for an insurer to be able to sell that damage protection anytime during the life cycle or the ownership of the product. So we'll tell him that, okay, you know, this product has gone through the diagnostic and image recognition process and you can give the insurance because I know that this phone is not broken, it's working fine. So now you're being able to open up a new revenue stream for also the technology that your team uses and that you've yeah. offered for the team. And um, that makes it a lot more exciting, right? There's so many more exciting things you could do with that uh, going forward. Uh, we've spoken so much about phones and, and mobiles. Um, what about other products? Uh, are people you know, wanting to buy TVs? They're wanting to buy, uh, you know, I, I think I saw on your webpage, uh, accessories. Uh, or different items um are, are these also come into the e-commerce category is there value there i mean laptops uh, is, is another segment uh, you know uh, these are things that people have in abundance yeah uh, and, yeah, yeah you know uh, does cashify play in any of those segments uh, well we we do play in laptops that's one of our uh, decently large segments of course mobile phone is 90 percent of our business to be honest but in the 10%, the biggest segment is laptops. Uh, we, we tried our hands at gaming consoles and TVs, but then we did not focus on it because one, the volume was not very high. Second, uh, handling a TV for reverse logistic is a pain uh, because 
value of the TV is is the screen. If there's anything that goes wrong in transit, you lose all your money. Mm. Uh, so we've now restricted ourselves to very limited pin codes uh, on TVs. But yes, laptops you're doing, and in the last three months, we've seen the demand for laptop has gone up drastically because people are working from home. Uh, yeah. Companies want to yeah. buy laptops today. I have open orders from organizations uh, who want to buy five thousand laptops, two thousand laptops for their employees and people who are now working from home, and they see that they're yeah. going to work from home for the next six to nine months. So right. laptops is one big segment, uh, but we're going to limit ourselves to mobile phones, laptops, uh, maybe one or more new categories that we've launched, which is a smart watch, because that's a new category which is now getting uh, very famous. But we are not right. we are not going to get into the other categories like white goods, refrigerator, washing yeah. machine, ACs. Yeah. That's something that we're not going to touch. I mean, in in India, I think uh, anything secondhand probably still has a market because uh, yeah. it's a it's a value and a price conscious market, and these are uh, items that you don't typically move around. Like uh, if you look in a fridge or uh, you know a laptop, it's not like you're walking around with them and you know you're gonna uh, drop it or uh, something else. So the chances of you being able to uh, you know upcycle it and do something with it is probably uh, uh, you know higher probability um, yeah what what have been some of the biggest challenges you faced uh, you've been doing this for over 10 years, six years uh, yeah. in the whole well cashify 6 years and there's been yeah. like a uh, whole e waste aspect to it so i've just kind of grouped them <laughs> uh, what have been some of the challenges you faced with this I think the cha- the biggest challenge is convincing people to part away with their old products. There's a lot of emotional value attached uh, to their uh, gadgets, and that's something uh, is changing. Uh, but still, people my age or you know in 35 to 40 year bracket or even uh, even 45, they still hold a lot of value to the first BlackBerry phone that they ever bought or the first smartphone that they ever bought and they're lying in their drawers. Uh, The second, I mean, challenge is to educate people that look, the products which are lying in your houses or in your drawers, they're actually valuable resources. Now, for every phone or new gadget that is manufactured, there is some kind of impact which we give to our environment in terms of mining, getting metals out, you know, making plastics through uh, crude, uh, making glass. So there is some kind of negative impact. And our vision uh, at Cashify is that we don't want any old gadget lying redundant in anybody's house across the world. And our challenge is to convince people to bring those devices back, either to be resold where you get a monetary value for it, or you want to recycle it will help you recycle. Today we have on Cashify a segment where if you have your old Nokia 2100 or 3100 lying in your house, uh, you just raise a request, we'll come to your house, pick up that device, give you you a voucher of 300, 400 rupees and get that phone responsibly recycled. And at the same time, we plant a tree for every phone that we recycle. In the last, you know, we launched this program almost one and a half, two months ago. Uh, okay. We've already planted around 3,000 trees. You know, uh, we've we've gotten more than 3,000 phones in the last two months. So I think, you know, right now and even going forward, the challenge would be to get people to get out, get their products out, recycle it, resell it. Business point of view, it makes sense. There's no challenge there. Of course, there are operational challenges. There are there are, you know, months which are demonetization months or COVID months, but those are all part and parcel of life. If there was no COVID, there would have been something else. You know, there are problems in life. So business goes from up, ups and downs. But I think the challenge is changing the perception, changing the mindset of people that one, it is easy to sell your old product. Second, it is the right thing to sell your old product. And it is the super right thing to recycle stuff which is lying in your house. We've just got one planet. Environment problem is real. Climate change is real. The only small part that you can do is at least get that kachra out of your house. 
so that the resources can be put back into the mainstream and used for something else and that's our that's our philosophy that's our underlying thought process why we started this business uh, of waste management recycling and that is where you know we are true to that even today and that's the problem we want to solve and that's the challenge that we want to solve like oh well said man i i think it's it is important uh, on the recycling side and and uh, you know come to think of it i do have a couple of nokia phones just lying around right so uh, i need to <laughs> yeah. relook at uh, you know what to do with it and and you know it's just about getting the word out i think a lot of people are looking uh, to do that and and you know it's about just finding the right avenues to do so um uh, Hey, uh, Cashify has raised some amount of capital uh, to be able to bring it uh, thus far. Um, you also have a Chinese investor uh, on your cap table. Uh, I, in the recent past, has been a lot of uh, you know debate on this. You probably the right person to ask this question. Has this been an advantage bringing an outside investor uh, with? chinese capital uh, yeah. because you have some pretty incredible indian investors as well uh, and and uh, in bloom uh, vc and uh, in besimer which is an american fund um, yeah uh, how does the dynamic work and what's your perspective here i think you know we have uh, four chinese investors not one so we have six investors on our cap table out of them four are chinese uh, uh, you know i would say leave aside the last 3 months which has been a lot of geopolitical tensions and and covid and what not and the government changing stance on the fdi policy just leave that aside for a moment i would say getting them on as investors was really helpful and i'll tell you why one of the investors uh, is a unicorn in this space in china so i hui show is one of our investors and today they do more than a million phones a month you know the way we do 1.3 1.4 lakh phones a month they do i think 11 lakh phones a month so that's that's a scale it's a 10x large company okay i think what that is yeah so what that gave us was a window of belief in ourselves that look this business can become that large till the day we saw them and we saw their back end facilities and the volumes that they were doing you know i'll be honest i'll be honest there was there were times when we would say you know we reach 200000 phones a month we're like solid we are we are there but once we saw those million phones and beyond we realized that this business could be much larger it could be a 2 million phones a month or 3 million phones a month business so what the chinese investment did was it changed our perspective and i think i was reading the other day uh, kunal shah tweeted uh, that you know the biggest thing that an indian kid uh, you know if you ask a indian kid which is the biggest landmark or a, or a man made thing that you've seen uh, a guy in probably in bombay would say it's you know the worldly sea link but a guy in china would say the great wall of china and look at the size of the great wall of china it's massive and when you see that you can you know uh you you can think of the scale that you know this is possible so i think that that was something that was an eye opener for us we could see a much larger scale when we went to china and interacted with them the second the majority of supply chain for a smartphone in india comes from china so having those investors actually opened a lot of doors for us when we were going to shenzhen and guangdong for our spare parts uh, procurement business uh it also it also you know gave us an insight on uh, how the business has evolved in china which is which to a large extent from smartphone perspective replicates the indian uh, market so what india is today from smartphone perspective was what china was 5 years ago and similarly the e-commerce industry has also evolved in, in that fashion so we've learned a lot from them of course money has no color to a large extent Uh, until unless you are in a very deep geopolitical disturbance yeah uh, we we we've we've tried to raise capital from the us we tried to keep raise capital in india but nobody understood this business uh, one it was not a sexy business second there was no comparative business in the us 
But in China, given that they've seen a unicorn, they've seen another company which is on the path of becoming a unicorn. Uh, right. The acceptance was high, and we we got the money. And so far, it has been it has been good. We've gained a lot from them. Uh, the last few months are unfortunate, uh, but as much as you want to be, you know, patriotic about your com- your country, uh, uh, getting money from China has helped us. So I would not have anything against the Chinese investors. But um, it's good to understand your perspective, and and you know, uh, I think the value. I mean, because most businesses also investors. look at china for inspiration saying okay what has worked here and hence it should work here at some point and and that's my thesis right yeah uh, so for me it is surprising that uh, you know you look at that and take inspiration but not welcome capital from people who could potentially help you in the same direction right um, yeah. Yeah. and and i think you put it in perspective uh, now that you're targeting 10 20 million uh, phones per month in india uh, what what's the path there how do you get to 10x of what you're doing today uh, is there like a light at the end of the tunnel which would get you there uh, is it is it that uh, there are not enough people buying and and you know cycling through phones fast enough for that to get there or do you see there a timeline after which you will hit those numbers Well, I think we are still a forty percent smartphone penetration market. If you if you look at uh, you know the the split, we are still sixty percent is still feature phones. A large segment is still two uh, G two G phones. And if you heard Mukesh Ambani speak in the Geo's uh, keynote and in last few days also, there are around five hundred million people who are on the two G network, which is essentially feature phone guys. So I think there are tailwinds in this industry. a lot of companies are trying to convert those uh, feature phone slash 2g customers to a smartphone customer and i think that's a very positive news for our industry because once people get onto that smartphone uh, bandwagon then it's just moving from one segment to the other then it's like owning a scooter to a maruti 800 to ultimately aspiring for a mercedes is the same behavior in smartphones so i think over the next 3 years is where we feel that uh, anywhere between the next 2 to 3 years we going to hit that uh, 1 million devices mark we are very uh, you know positive about uh, geo pushing and you know putting a lot of uh, perspective a lot of uh, impetus on converting the 2g customers to smartphones which is going to happen over the next 12 to 15 to 18 months and i think uh, our business is going to grow on uh, you know parallelly to that so that's that's the major tailwind uh, that we are you know envisioning of course our business and our uh, strategies are there from marketing perspective and more and more online alliances with all the key uh, brands that we work with but i think this is another exciting window that's opening up uh fantastic i mean wish you guys the best of luck uh, on the journey uh, it's just going to be uh, i'll be rooting for you because i love the cash pay business uh I'm I'm typically drawn towards unsexy businesses uh, <laughs> because I think the real money can be made in unsexy businesses. In my opinion, uh, it may be unpopular, but <laughs> it's a I, you well, know I personally believe that more unsexy and unpopular you are, the lesser the competition, and uh, the more chances of you to fail and come back again and build a long-term sustainable company. So um, on that note. Uh, are you hiring uh, i know that you mentioned uh, things have bounced back a little bit uh, and you're looking at the market um, and with the renewed interest in devices and now a new market opening up uh, are you looking for more people to come on board if yes what kind of people well uh, you know we had put in a con- company wide freeze on mark- on hiring for the last few months but now we are hiring only for engineering talent and product manager so on the business side we're not hiring anybody uh, most of our hiring effort today is uh, to get prod senior product managers technical product managers plus developers uh, in android ios java so that's that's the that's that's where you know we're focusing a lot apart from that there is no hiring 
if uh, if somebody listening to this wants to apply, uh, go to your careers page and uh, they can write to uh, uh, Mandeep at Cashify dot in. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Please do. I, I would, I would, I would love to review, and if, especially if you are a, you know, you somebody who's who's proficient in Flutter uh, in Android, just just drop me a line. I would love to chat. Uh, hey Mandeep, thanks so much. This has been amazing. Uh, thanks for sharing all your learnings from Cashify. Thank you, Varun. It was it was a pleasure to be part of your program. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, hey guys, uh, thanks for listening in. Uh, you heard Mandeep Manocha of Cashify today. So don't forget to subscribe and stay tuned to some amazing entrepreneurs just like Mandeep right here on the podcast. <laughs>